Our presenters today are Diane Allingham Hawkins, Senior Director of the Genetic Test Evaluation Program and Technical Editing here at Hayes. Diane is a board certified molecular geneticist and cytogeneticist and ran genetic diagnostic labs for more than a decade before joining Hayes to launch the GTE program in 2008. Joining Diane today is Pam Weber, Director of Client Services and Clinical Research Support. Pam brings over 20 years of experience in clinical nursing, coverage policy development, and utilization management to her role at Hayes. At this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Don uh, Allingham Hawkins. Diane? Thank you, Karen. Uh, Pam and I will be tag teaming during this webinar, and I will start the discussion uh, about genetic tests and the challenges associated with them, and then we'll present a hypothetical example of how we perform our evidence-based assessment of genetic tests. I will then pass the baton to Pam to explain how our conclusions can be translated into defensible coverage policy. The overall goal of today's webinar is to provide an overview of Hayes' approach to the evidence-based evaluation of genetic and genomic tests and to demonstrate how to apply Hayes' conclusions and recommendations to design evidence-based defensible coverage policies. Our learning objectives are as follows. By the end of this webinar, the participants should be able to describe Hayes' approach to evidence-based evaluation of medical technologies, including genetic tests, explain how Hayes' reports and conclusions can support coverage determinations, and apply this approach within the participant's organizational structure. Okay, so now we have those initial items out of, items out of the way. So we're going to start with a polling question because it's always fun to um, do some of these questions to get some interaction with the audience. So our first polling question is, are you currently involved in preparing coverage policies for genetic tests? And your choices are yes. Uh, as A, B, as our organization does write coverage policies, but I'm not involved, or C, our organization does not cover genetic tests. And we'll just give everyone a few minutes, a few seconds to vote. It's always more fun when everybody participates and um, we get a good feel for the mix of our audience at this, for this webinar. So we'll just give everyone maybe five more seconds. Almost everybody has voted now. And I think we can go ahead and close this poll and share the results. So this is interesting. And I can see that, that almost 70% of those who voted are, in fact, involved in preparing coverage policies. So hopefully this, in, this webinar will give you a little more um, insight into how our work can be used for that. And then another 22% um, have or in their, within their organizations do write policies, but they're not personally involved. So let's move on back to the webinar. So what are the, some of the challenges of genetic tests? I'm sure almost everyone attending this webinar is well aware of the challenges presented by these tests, which include multiple applications of the test, a rapid growth in the clinical availability of, of tests, a lack of regulatory oversight, ambiguous coding, high cost, and of course, the appropriateness of the testing for any given patient. Unlike many medical tests, genetic tests often have applications beyond the traditional diagnosis of symptomatic individuals. There can also be carrier testing in family members, predictive or predisposition testing, prognostic testing to predict the course of a disease, pharmacogenetic tests that may be used to predict response to or adverse effects from specific drugs, prenatal testing, and newborn screening. Consequently, in the course of evaluating a given test, one must consider the evidence base for any possible application of the test rather than just confirmation of diagnosis. The field of genetic testing has experienced an exponential rate of growth in recent years. This graph from the website genetest.org shows the rapid growth from 1993 to 2011. More recently, the new genetic test registry, which is managed by the, by the NIH, 
announced that there are more than 10,000 entries for more than 3,300 conditions. With so many new tests entering the market each, each year, it is virtually impossible to be familiar with all of them. With respect to regulatory oversight of genetic tests in the United States, the reality is that most genetic tests are not FDA cleared or approved, but rather fall under the category of laboratory developed tests, or LDTs. LDTs are in vitro diagnostic tests developed validated and used by a single laboratory entity. LDTs are not subject to FDA approval or clearance, although they do fall under the FDA's responsibility. Historically, the category of LDTs was designed for simple, single analyte tests. But with genetic tests in particular, many LDTs have become much more complex and less transparent. The labs performing the tests are subject to oversight by the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment, which applies to any clinical laboratory testing done on a U.S. resident. The CLIA requirements are not specific for genetic tests, meaning that issues such as equipment, control, validation, and education requirements, among other things, um, are, are not addressed by CLIA. One of the most challenging issues related to genetic tests has been coding. Historically, coding has been nonspecific with the use of so-called stacking codes. The new MOPATH, or molecular pathology, CPT codes that were introduced in 2012 have helped to improve specificity for tests that fall under the Tier 1 codes, although the Tier 2 codes are still nonspecific. In addition, many tests are not covered by either Tier 1 or Tier 2 codes and thus end up falling under a general code. Cost is a major issue with genetic tests. These are typically much more expensive than other medical tests, and there is a wide range of costs even for similar tests. Some of the factors that might affect cost are patent or licensing issues, test complexity, and methodology used. And of course, the million dollar question is the appropriateness. How can we determine if a test is right for a given patient at a given point in their care? And how do we know that information obtained from a genetic test will improve the patient outcome? Well, that's where Hayes comes in. Hayes uses an evidence-based approach to evaluating genetic tests, as well as all the other medical technologies we evaluate. Our proprietary methodology combines well-established evidence grading that is aligned with the grade working group methodology together with the unique elements that must be considered for genetic tests, such as those outlined by the ACCE model on the left-hand side of your screen, which was developed by the National Office of Public Health Genomics of the CDC. The ACCE model specifically evaluates the areas of analytical validity, or how well the test performs in the lab, clinical validity, or how well the test performs in the clinic, and clinical utility, uh, which is assuming the test works in the lab and in the clinic, how does it impact um, outcomes for the patient? And of course, all the ethical, legal, and social implications associated with the test cut across these other elements. For each application of a test assessed, we assign a Hayes GTE rating. The Hayes GTE rating reflects the strength and direction of the evidence regarding the safety and efficacy of a genetic test, its impact on health outcomes, indications for use, patient selection criteria, and comparisons with other technologies. The ratings are scaled A through D1 and D2 with an A reading, rating indicating an unequivocal high level of po positive published evidence of benefit, and D1 indicating an unequivocal lack of benefit. Ratings of B and C fall between these two extremes and indicate, indicate gaps in the evidence base, with C representing our most equivocal rating. Finally, a D2 rating indicates that there is insufficient published evidence to evaluate the test. 
So how big of a problem is the lack of evidence when it comes to genetic tests? Well, of the more than 240 genetic and genomic tests that we've evaluated to date, approximately 44% have a D1 or a D2 as the highest rating, meaning that there is either evidence the test adds nothing to patient care, or there is insufficient evidence to evaluate the test impact on patient care. So how do you translate that into coverage policy? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through a hypothetical example that allows us to illustrate our approach to navigating the forest of genetic tests. And our hypothetical example is, an, is a newly discovered form of familial breast cancer. We're going to call it Weber-Allingham-Hawkins syndrome because gen geneticists like to name diseases after themselves. Although Weber-Allingham-Hawkins syndrome is rare, occurring in just 1 in 10,000 people, it is highly penetrant, which means that carrying a, a variant in the WAH gene virtually ensures that a woman will develop breast cancer by the age of 40. Men are not at risk of developing the disease themselves, but they are able to pass the variant to their daughters, who would be at risk. So men essentially are carriers of the variant but don't have clinical symptoms or can be cured. There are no other cancers that have been reported in families with Weber-Allingham-Hawkins syndrome, which that makes this disorder a pure hereditary breast cancer syndrome. An evidence-based health technology assessment has to start with the PICO. PICO is a mnemonic, mnemonic for patient population, intervention, comparison, and outcome. And outlining these elements help us to frame the question we are trying to answer. In this example, two potential patient populations may be women who are affected with breast cancer that is apparently familial in nature, or unaffected women who come from families that either are known to have Weber-Allingham-Hawkins syndrome or families that have some kind of unidentified familial breast cancer syndrome. The intervention is a genetic test, which may be specific to the gene, the WAH gene, or may include that gene as part of a panel of genes associated with familial breast cancer or familial cancer syndromes in general. The comparison is genetic testing versus no genetic testing. Essentially, what does the genetic test add to the care of patients affected with or at risk for Weber-Allingham-Hawkins syndrome? And then the outcomes would be the changes in patient treatment or care or management that is due to the information obtained from the genetic test. So you can already see how potentially complex things can be, even in this very simple hypothetical example. So for the, the purposes of our hypothetical example, we're going to uh, focus on unaffected women from families either known to have or suspected to have Weber-Allingham-Hawkins syndrome. The intervention would be WAH gene testing alone or as part of the panel. The comparisons are testing versus no testing and single gene testing versus panel testing. And finally, the outcomes we are interested in are whether these genetic test results have an impact on women who are at risk for breast cancer. So is there anything that can be done to change the risk associated with this familial cancer, uh, breast cancer syndrome. The goal of the search strategy is to identify the best available evidence. Uh, to avoid a lot of extraneous returns, the strategy should be focused on the specific patient population. In our example, it would be unaffected women, the indication which in our example is pre-symptomatic testing for Weber-Allingham-Hawkins syndrome, and the test, which would be either be an individual WAH gene test 
on a panel test. In the case of the panel test, we would include all of the genes that are in the panel in our search strategy. We may use several different search strategies in order to identify all the relevant studies. So for example, we'll search by gene and indication, or we'll search by a proprietary test name, or by a, a lab that is offering that test. We combine the results of all of these strategies uh, to, get a, to identify all the literature. We also use a variety of sources, which may include the gray literature. And the gray literature refers to unpublished studies, FDA submissions, laboratory websites, conference proceedings, and other sources. It is important to note, however, that only peer-reviewed published studies are used to inform the Hayes rating. And finally, it's important that the search process be iterative, um, refining the search strategy as you proceed, and ultimately identifying all of the relevant literature, which can then be evaluated and synthesized for um, our assessment. So the published evidence is going to differ depending on the test performed. So the single gene test on the left-hand side versus a panel that includes that gene. So let's start with the left-hand side of the screen. Although there were no studies of the analytical validity, the methodology is Sanger sequencing, which is considered a gold standard in genetic testing, and the labs performing the test are CLIA certified, which is a minimum standard for providing clinical testing. With respect to clinical validity, there are four case control studies with a total of 600 subjects. The results are consistent across the studies in that WAH variants are found in about 40% of unaffected women from pure breast cancer families, which is important because as we established, breast cancer is the only cancer that is uh, common in this syndrome, compared with less than 1% of unaffected women from families with broader familial cancer syndrome, and less than 1% of unaffected women with a family history that is not consistent with a familial cancer syndrome. Now, if we think a little bit about an unaffected woman in, in a family that has this disorder, we would only expect 50% of those women to actually carry the, of the women at risk to actually carry variants and be affected. So if we're finding a 40% uh, positive rate among this population, then that would indicate that this syndrome, Weber-Allingham-Hawkins syndrome, is common among the pure, these pure breast family, breast cancer families, but rare in the broader familial cancer syndrome families and in the general population. With respect to clinical utility, two studies have compared breast cancer rates in WAH carriers who have undergone prophylactic mastectomies compared to WAH carriers who have not had mastectomies or women who are at risk but have not been tested. Both studies show that WH carriers who have mastectomies have breast cancer rates lower than population, which is about one in eight. While about 90, more than 90% of carriers who do not have mastectomies develop breast cancer by the age of 40. Untested at-risk women have breast cancer rates between the two groups, consistent with the expectation that some at-risk women will not carry pathogenic variants. So based on the published evidence, the use of WAH gene testing in unaffected women from a pure hereditary breast cancer family is given a B rating. This rating reflects the consistent association between breast cancer in these families and WAH variants. In addition, two studies have shown that a change in care based on the test results, which is the prophylactic mastectomy, has resulted in better outcomes, which is a reduced incidence of breast cancer among known carriers. The rating is a B rather than an A because the clinical utility studies are retrospective rather than prospective. So that's the single gene testing only. So let's now turn to the panel test. 
We know that panel tests are becoming more and more available, and often, especially in syndromes where there may be multiple genes, a panel will be used in a lab. So this panel test, this hypothetical panel test, includes the WAH gene along with 10 other genes that have been reported to be associated with breast cancer, which including genes such as BRCA1, BRCA2, P53, and others. With the exception of WAH, however, variants in these genes have all been associated with cancers other than breast cancer in these families. So they are associated with a broader cancer family syndrome. Several search strategies fail to identify any studies evaluating testing of these 11 genes in women with breast cancer, whether in pure hereditary breast cancer families or in broader cancer families. Consequently, this test is given a D2 rating indicating that there is insufficient evidence to assess the value of wider testing in this population. So let's pause here for another polling question. So the next uh, polling question we'd like to ask is, does your organization approve gene panel testing? And the answers, uh, your choices are yes. Uh, B, only if evidence warrants the use of the panel. C, depends on the indication or the cost of the panel. D, no, pan, we consider panels research tests. And E, I don't know. And again, we'll just give you a few seconds to, to answer. Um, again, it's more fun if everyone participates and we get a wider cross-section of um, opinions. We'll just say about five more seconds. So we'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results. So 54% of you um, indicate that it's only if the evidence warrants the use of a panel. And uh, we wholeheartedly agree with that here at Hayes. And then a, a smaller proportion indicated that it really depends on the indication and the cost of the panel. And that certainly reflects organizational um, preferences. So now what I'm going to do is turn the presentation over to Pam to explain how our conclusions can be used to inform coverage policies. So Pam? Okay, thank you, Diane. So if we take the information that Diane presented to us, um, the clinical studies, now we have our evidence foundation that we can actually move forward with and start actually authoring our policy and putting together our background. From the information that we have found, we know who our patient population would be. We also have information from the literature on the WAH gene. We know that there are two methods of testing um, that can be used. Uh, in order to determine if these variants are present. We could do single gene testing or we could do panel testing. We also know, based on the clinical data, that outcomes um, from the studies have shown that the uh, using information from the genetic test and we can do treatment planning uh, for these patients that are impacted by the variants. And that the clinical studies also have shown that there is a difference between outcomes of patients who have been treated um, due to having this variant be present versus those who have not. So using this information, um, and while we also know and would like to make a recommendation, it is important that you as a payer, we understand, are faced with many business determinations that you would have to take into account. You are very well aware of who your membership uh, entails, your risk pool distribution that you're having to deal with, whether you currently within your plan language address specific genetic tests, or within your plan language if you actually exclude uh, specific coverage. So this would be information that you would have to take into account. Um, even regardless to what the evidence shows. But if we were going to make an evidence recommendation to you, 
our coverage recommendation would be that we provide coverage for single gene testing in women who are less than or equal to 40 years of age with a known family history of the syndrome to be in a first or a second degree relative. And this is certainly based from a recommendation standpoint on the strength of the evidence that was located. We also feel that because there are two methods of testing for this gene variant that we need to address within a policy as well, the panel testing. And if we think back on the evidence, the panel testing really, we would recommend non-coverage for that simply from a standpoint that with this particular variant, it's more from the pure family, uh, breast cancer, grouping, and with the panel testing, we're getting into the broader uh, cancer uh, groups. And it really, at that point, would be considered experimental, investigational, and or unproven. That may not be language that you use um, within your organization. You may just tweak this to be that panel testing is excluded. So that would be an easy change for you to make. Within our genetic uh, test evaluation assessments, we also provide additional information. And this information is, we feel, very important because what we're trying to do within our reports is save you and your staff time from having to go out, search within different databases, and pull information together. We also provide this information in relation to the labs that are currently available and state that they can run and perform these tests. So we will look at their current CLIA status, which as Dr. Allingham pointed out, is the basic quality status that the lab has. We'll provide test-specific codes and or generic codes that may still be in place for a genetic test. And we will provide for you the pricing that can be obtained in relation to those tests as well. I do want to stop here and just speak to you a little bit about this from a standpoint that we feel this information is informative, that if this happened to be a genetic test that you were going to expand coverage um, for your members to have, then proactively you could look at, OK, the lab that is providing the test, is this a lab that already falls within your network? Um, if not, then proactively you could take a look at, OK, do I need to expand my contract to include this specific laboratory? Because you certainly want your members and your providers to be able to order the test and for your members to have easy access to um, those laboratory centers. Within our report, we also pull additional pieces of information together, such as specialty societies, we go out and search the literature to see if there's been a published position paper or special uh, guidelines that happen to talk about the use of a genetic test. We'll pull that information forward and place that within a very specific portion of the report. Special note here, even though we pull this information forward, and as Dr. Ellingham was talking about, when we look at the literature, we may have to read some gray literature to really get a full feel of the genetic test, of all the information surrounding it. Pulling this information into our report, this does not in any way impact the Hayes rating. Just because there is a society position paper or guidelines, or if we note that different commercial payers, or even CMS might be providing coverage for something. This is simply added information to help you um, so that you don't have to go and pull this information forward. So we provide, as, I, as on the slide, specialty society information. When we look at reimbursement, to give you an insight from that perspective, we do look at CMS at the national level for national coverage determinations. We do not look at the local carriers. And there's a reason for that. The local carriers really vary carrier by carrier and even state by state within those carriers. And this can be very difficult to keep up with. However, for any of you who are on the line with us today who are genetic clients, if a local carrier is 
a question that you have and you would like assistance in locating information about a specific genetic test, then certainly you have access to our clinical research support team, and we'll gladly assist you in trying to locate that information as quickly as possible. We do look at some commercial payers, and we will pull specifics of their particular policies forward to give you an idea of kind of what others are doing. We feel it's very important to also have within our reports information on ongoing clinical trials that are currently underway. Because especially if we have a report that has a D2 rating or a C rating, it could be the outcomes from those particular studies that as we follow the literature and watch it over time, those outcomes can have a very important impact on what our rating may be down the road. All of our genetic test evaluation reports do go through an annual review. And it's more than just looking at a review of the literature. That is very important, but it's one component. We also step back and look to see if any of the laboratories that were mentioned in the original report, if they still hold their current CLIA certification, or if that certification has been lost. We look at specialty societies to see if that position um, paper uh, or their stance or their guides have changed in any way, or if any of the coverage um, determinations by CMS or the, the commercial payers, if that has changed over the past year. We'll provide a summary of our findings so our clients can easily tell whether or not the new information, especially from a literature perspective, if it's significant enough that it's going to warrant our need to actually do a full text review, actually pull our report, completely reanalyze, and incorporate that new information. And if so, it could definitely impact our rating. If we do not feel that the new information is significant enough to impact our rating, you will see that at the top um, as part of the summary of that annual review document. And at this Thank point, I'm, I'm going to hand the presentation back over to Diane. Thanks, Pam. Uh, well, hopefully our very simple, uh, uh, admittedly and acknowledged simple, hypothetical <laughs> example has given you a sense of how our Hayes resources can assist you in making defensible coverage decisions. So what we want to do at this time is look at a, a real-life example of a panel test. So this is a screenshot of our Hayes GTE synopsis uh, regarding the Breast Next Next Gen Cancer Panel offered by Ambry Genetics. This test has a list price of about $3,900 and includes 18 genes, including BRCA1 and BRCA2, that have been reported to be associated with uh, familial breast cancer. So looking at our conclusions, you can see that the conclusion is that there is insufficient published evidence um, for the use of this test. And I would like to point out that that D2 rating does not imply necessarily that the test isn't a good test or should, it can't be used. It, it tells you that we simply cannot make that determination based on the public, published evidence. So there are actually no studies of analytical validity. The methodology that is used in this panel and in many panels is next generation sequencing. Um, next generation sequencing is a much higher throughput method um, and that can be uh, implemented by labs. There are issues with respect to the analytical sensitivity of these tests. Um, and the standards are still being developed. Uh, there's quite a bit of difference between platforms, next generation sequencing platforms. So unlike Sanger sequencing, which has been well developed um, and well validated, the uh, evidence regarding next generation sequencing is still accumulating. Um, there are actually no studies that include all 18 genes that are currently in the clinically available panel in, uh, in, in women with breast cancer. There is, however, one, a single study that was published earlier this year 
that describes uh, use of a previous version of the test that did not include BRCA1 or 2 um, and also excluded two other genes that are now on the panel. So it was a 14-gene version of the panel. What this study found was that uh, about 7.4% of the individuals tested had a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant in one of the 14 genes that was that were um, tested. However, 19.8% had inconclusive results. Um, so something found in one or more of the 14 genes that could not be interpreted as pathogenic or not. And this suggests that nearly three times as many tested individuals would receive inconclusive results than those who receive potentially clinically actionable results. And it's one of the limitations of these panel tests. These tests have largely been driven by the technology, which is the next generation sequencing that allows the generation of a great deal of data in a single uh, reaction but the downstream effects of testing so many genes are that you will obtain many more clinically unclear results. So clearly at this point, there needs to be more studies that show that the clinically available version of this test um, provides that the risks, of, sorry, the benefits of this test outweigh the risks and limitations of the test. And so this is really a great example of a resounding D2 rating at this point in time. And I think really illustrates the, the challenge that many of our clients face in evaluating these panels um, and, and when a panel might be useful and when it may not be useful. And I would like to say that the um, the labs themselves are taking a step back and looking at these panels, recognizing that the curation of variants in these genes among uh, affected or at-risk individuals is really not complete at this time, and we probably don't know enough to be testing uh, these large panel genes. So I think this is a developing story, and I think we're going to see more uh, in the in the two years to come. But I am going to just quickly hand it back to Pam so she can talk about how we would, um, if we were converting this into a coverage policy, what our, our wording would be. Pam? So based on what the literature did show for this particular panel, um, we would come forth with a recommendation that there not be uh, coverage as these tests uh, at this particular point uh, in time and from a study perspective are still considered experimental investigational and or unproven. And the caveat to that being, you know, there really is an absence of clinical data within the literature that supports their use. It's not clear how we could apply the information. It's not clear if there's utility of use um, in being able to plan treatment or have any type of impact from a patient outcome perspective at this particular point in time. So that would be our recommendation on this particular uh, sequence testing. Great. Thanks, Pam. And then I just wanted to mention a few more resources that we have in our GTE um, program that can help clients navigate the landscape of genetic tests. So these include our GTE algorithms and our new GTE lab comparison tables. The GTE algorithms are interactive decision trees designed to address genetic testing in complex patient populations. They are designed to be complementary to our evidence-based reports and to answer the question, where does this genetic test fit in the continuum of patient care? we add new algorithms on a monthly basis. This is a screenshot of one of our GT algorithms, which addresses molecular tests used for evaluation of indeterminate thyroid nodules. 
um, unfortunately, the complete um, functionality of the algorithms is not uh, obvious from this screenshot. Um, but certainly, we would be, if anyone is interested, we would be delighted to set up a time to demonstrate them for you. And this is just a partial list of the GT algorithms that we currently have. And as I mentioned before, we do add new ones on a monthly basis. So the, the number is increasing regularly. And then one of the other questions that we hear from clients is how similar tests compare between labs. So although we include information about tests in our report, the information is fairly high level and doesn't make direct comparisons between labs. Um, our lab comparison tables are a new enhancement to the GTE program. So this is just a portion of one such table comparing BRCA1 and 2 testing provided by different laboratories. The full table has information on six different labs. As you can see, it provides specific information regarding each lab offering, including the lab and test name, the methodology used, the sensitivity and specificity, the variant of unknown significance rate, which is particularly important in sequencing-based tests, the turnaround time, the relevant CPT codes, the cost, uh, whether the lab is CLIA certified and the expiration date, if we can ascertain that, sample reports, which we have embedded um, into the actual table when we are able to get these from the lab. They're not always available. And then a link to the actual uh, website describing the test. All of this information is gathered based on information from the laboratory website and in email and telephone discussions with laboratory representatives. We also include basic background information, a glossary of terms, a discussion of different test methodologies with live links to references, and a conclusion regarding whether there is any substantive difference between uh, different lab offerings. These uh, lab comparison tables are available for uh, at client request now. We are currently updating our website to provide a section of the website where the lab comparison tables will be housed, and we expect that to be uh, launched in late July. So stay tuned for, for that information. And one of the things that these tapes that we envision these tables could do is, would be, as Pam pointed out, when uh, a client is trying to determine what lab to contract with, having such a comparison available may assist them in making that decision. So we want to make sure that we have uh, enough time for questions. So we'll just give you some um, high-level conclusions, um, obviously, that our genetic test evaluations are, are evidence-based and do provide the foundation to support the authoring of, of defensible coverage policies that you may use to expand, limit, or exclude your coverage or support maintaining an existing policy. And you can um, excerpt some of our evaluation reports and certainly cite them within the bibliography of your coverage policy.